Okay, in this video, we're going to look at actually running the final simulation. So uh, uh, what I've done here is I've just opened up one of the uh, Telemac prompts. So this installs on your desktop when you install Telemac. Uh, so this is really kind of like specific to Telemac. It knows when you type in the command like telemac2d.py is going to print out an error because the arguments aren't being supplied to it. Uh, if you type that into your console, like say you open up CMD and you type this in, it's not going to work. You really need to use the um, the command prompt that appears as a shortcut on your desktop when you install Telemac in Windows. Um, so yeah, basically all I've done is I've just navigated to my file. Uh, so this is where the case file is located. If you go into desktop i have it here to telemax simulation file so we have we're, we're working with this baxter underscore steady underscore state dot underscore modified case file here uh so i've just i'm in this directory i've navigated it to it if you're not familiar with navigation uh you're gonna have to get familiar with it but it's generally actually the commands are pretty easy with telemac you just use cd which stands for change directory dot dot will bring you back uh going to cd uh, you can put a T here and then a control D will allow you to kind of search within uh, the root directory for another directory so you can go back into it. If you do DIR, that's just lists all the contents of your directory. Uh, I'll leave it to you to really kind of learn how to use the uh, the uh, command prompt. But So those are basically two simple things if you just want to to kind of know what's in your directory and also how to navigate around it's just using control D. Uh, honestly, that's about all that you really need to use or to know in order to, to run Telemac from the uh, um, from the command prompt, at least in a, using its basic functions. Uh, so in order to run the case file, so we, we have it all set up here. Uh, I went through this in the last video. Uh, what we need to do is just go in, go into here. Uh, we type in telemac 2d with a just a small case for all the letters dot py and then you need to type in baxter steady underscore state underscore modified you may wish to shorten the name of this so you don't have to type out so many things it's up to you but when we click enter uh, you'll see that it basically starts running the simulation uh, a bunch of things print out and I'll, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm just going to let this run for a few iterations and then just talk about um, some of the information that's actually being output here. So uh, we're actually doing the calculation at the moment. We see we've gone from iteration 0 to iteration 100. Uh, in a few more seconds, we see 200 here. I'll let this kind of keep going. We can just scroll up here uh, and I'll show you what happened. So this is the command. Oh, it's going to keep refresh it. I'll just let it go to 400 then I'll stop it um, and then I can just go through and explain some of this data. So 400. So we're just going to do control C will stop which is actually something that might be useful if you realize that you've made an error in your case file uh, and you just want to stop it. You can just do control C. Uh, it's pretty much like that for every program that you run from the control line so it's not just specific to Telemac. You can do that with pretty much everything. And uh, so th this is the command that we entered um, here that launched the telemac2d.py program here. Uh, you can see it prints out the version number of Telemac that we're using. Uh, I have no idea what this means. I think this is just a, uh, just like, it's a tag on their download system that they use uh, just to know what version it is. Don't quote me on it, but I think that's what it is, revision 13690. Um, you know, there's different code revisions that come out every so often, so I guess this is just a way for them to keep track of it. Uh, what you can see here, most of this information, it's using the configuration file. Uh, that's not something that we need to talk about in this video. Uh, most of the stuff is not really all that interesting or useful. We know that we're running in English, whatever, going down. So this is really kind of like the listing. So listing... Uh, I guess this is a um, kind of corresponds with this listing printout period. So we're looking at the listing of Telemac 2D. And then they've drawn this nice graphic where you can see some vegetation and some fish and some bubbles and the free water or free surface up here. 
uh, I, it's a lot of effort to do that. You know, it's really great that they're doing those sorts of things. Uh, it lets you know you're using Telemac. Uh, for each module, there's a different, it's actually kind of cool. Like if you use the sediment transport model, SIS, they have something different here. So, you know, try them out. It's kind of interesting. Um, going down a little bit further, most of this, so this is that Baxter River tutorial. That's the only place where I can see that the title keyword actually gets used. So Baxter River tutorial, you see that appear here in the, in the printout, Baxter River tutorial. Um, and then you see different uh, information about the mesh. So we have uh, the number of elements, the number of points, uh, maximum number of elements around a point. Most of the stuff is not really all that interesting. But, I mean, maybe it is if you're, you know, if you're developing something in Telemac and you want to just make sure that things are being read in correctly, you can do it. But what is kind of important is just to the friction coefficients have been read in the geometry file. So as you remember, we exported bottom friction out in the geometry file here. You can therefore see that it's confirmed to have been read in from the geometry file. So from my understanding, this is overriding the friction coefficient that appears in the steering file here. So you have 0 0.06. Uh, instead, what it's using is the friction coefficients that are coming from the geometry file. Um, yeah, and then here we have three boundaries. So we have liquid boundaries. Those correspond to each of the uh, liquid boundaries. So if I'll just bring in the boundary condition file here again. Um, make that visible so we have one two and three uh, the brown are actually the solid boundaries so we have three of those two one two and three and you can see those appear here so we have three liquid boundaries three solid boundaries and then it gives you information about each of those boundaries and within there you have the information about its starting point and its its end point and its global coordinates and a bunch of information there which may or may not be useful for you uh, the solid boundaries uh, also the same and then it brings in a initialization of an I curve I don't know what I curve stands for but three I assume that this is uh, related to the boundary condition three which is the downstream end this one here and this is the printout of the stage discharge curve so it's just re literally read it into its program and now it's using that so uh, then it has some other uh, keywords that are being implemented, bottom smoothings. I believe this just has to do to kind of smooth out uh, abrupt irregularities in the bottom uh, geometry. So sometimes you have points that maybe break too quickly between you have a very large elevation difference and a very short distance. So this, I guess, helps smooth that out and probably has to do more with like the numerical aspects of the code and make sure that it doesn't crash. And then finally, after you go through all those kind of like initial uh, loads that Telemac is doing, you end up with the printout from the simulation itself. So here, this is the first iteration, and you can see that it doesn't really have much more information other than iteration zero, time zero, uh, maximum current number, it's printing that out. Then it says Telemac 2D initialized using streamlined version 7.3 for characteristics. I couldn't tell you what that is. If you know, just mention it in the comments. Uh, then it does 100 iterations. You don't see anything print out for a short period of time. And then it prints out the kind of the results after that, that those 100 iterations. So you can see that the time has now moved from 0 to 8 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, I guess 500 seconds have elapsed uh, between the uh, in, in between printouts. Uh, there's some different information here. Uh, I can't really comment too much on it. Um, the balance, this is interesting. You have the total volume of water in the domain. Uh, so at 100 iterations, you can see that we have 0 0.57 times 10 to the 8 meters cubed. Um, and we have the amount of flow that's moving in and out of each of the boundaries. So that main Baxter channel, we have a positive, uh, which stands for inflow, of 570 meters cubed per second. Uh, the Thule, we have 11.5, and then the amount of flow that's moving out of the downstream boundary is 13,454.6 meters cubed per second. Uh, and you, you can watch these kind of evolve as the simulation advances, and you'll see that the total volume within the domain decreases as that initial 20 meter water height actually kind of drains on the downstream end. Uh, and even just eight seconds later, so we have iteration 200, you can see that the water within the domain has dropped from uh, up here it was 0.5769, here we're at 
three six and then if you go another hundred iterations into the future we're below that 0 0.50 at 0.48 times 10 to the eighth and eventually this is going to just peter out and reach a steady state and we'll have basically the same amount of water within the domain as time advances and that's one indication that the simulation has actually reached steady state uh, so just watch that and uh, that's one iter one way to to, to confirm uh, temporal convergence um, there's there's other ways but uh, that's one of them another way is to look at the total flux that's moving in so here you have 570 meters cubed you have 11.5 so in theory we should have 581.5 meters cubed actually leaving the downstream end you can see that we have way more flow than that at the moment but with each uh, 100 iterations, you can see that that is decreasing because up here we're at 13,454. Now we're less than 10,000, uh, 7,300, and then 5,800. And then each time step is going to keep getting lower and lower. And eventually it's going to reach that negative 581.5 or very close to it. And then that's starting to be a good indication that you know the simulations reach its reached its uh, its steady state time so uh if we just let this eventually what ends up happening you you let this run and um it will go through all of these again and then it will end uh with a printout and um yeah well it will end with a printout uh basically saying that everything's worked and that you know the simulation is completed and you will see when all that is done you'll see in your uh you'll see this this baxter underscore sss underscore results will appear in your directory uh, or in the location that you specified here again if you want to put the results file in a different directory you can specify it with forward slashes um, you can even go back uh, say you want to put it in the directory before the main the directory where the steering file is you can do the dot dot forward slash and it will put it there or you know if you want to put like it in another folder say you have you have your steering file in one folder and you want to go back to the, the go up a directory and then put it in the results in that directory you can do this so there's a bunch of different things but in this case we had it in the same folder as the case file so that's where it appears. You have it here. And then, of course, if you want to, I was playing around with this earlier. I'm just going to remove these really quickly just to show you um, how this works. But you just remove those and you can go file, open in Blue Canoe, and you can bring in that cellophane file, open it. You can see uh, a total frame count of 11. I guess there's 11 printouts within this file. You can go OK and uh you have these printouts so each of these oh, uh, each of these corresponds to uh basically those printouts that we saw here uh so u v s uh, b h fruit number and l so if we wanted to take a look at the fruit number for example we could put this in here and you can see initially uh what you want to do is just click on animate and then just back up the time step and i can't say whether or not this is going to be exciting to look at but you can see here that it's changed color it changes color a little bit as the depth changes and the velocity changes you can see the fruit number changes downstream but what's a little bit easier to see is this so make that visible and animate that okay so you can see here some velocity vectors if i get rid of the mesh maybe so you end up seeing the mesh all the time, but you can see here you have uh, as as water is kind of rushing out of the domain. You know, if I advance at one time step, you have a very large amount of water that's moving through that that downstream end. You have higher velocities along the center line here, and then you just step into the future. You can see that the amount that is leaving the domain is actually decreasing. So I'm going back in time, forward in time here. You can see it's decreasing as the simulation is kind of steadying itself. Uh, and then all along the river, you can see these different velocity contours, or these different velocity vectors on each of the nodes. And eventually these will all kind of like, these will steady out and uh, you won't see any difference in them if you advance in time. So basically, yeah, you can look at any, any of these, um, 
uh, free surface elevation, you can put that in here. Um, of course, you have the velocities there, so just make this invisible for the moment. Uh, maybe make the fruit number invisible. This is visible. I'm not sure if this is going to change much. If we go, okay. That's not changing very much. Maybe I'm looking at something wrong, but whatever. I mean, basically, you know, your results are in those. You just load them into Blue Canoe. You throw them onto a 2D view, and you can, you know, you can visualize them. And you can also go into other other ways of, you know, like you could use lines to extract. Um, you know the water surface elevation across a line, and using the sim similar methods as what we used here to to measure the uh, bathymetry, like the change in bathymetry as we increase the the height of the levee. So that basically is puts a cap on you know using Telemac 2D to do a simple hydrodynamic model. Uh, of course, this is a very robust program. You can model all sorts of different phenomena. You can put in wind, you can put in waves, uh, you can put in sediment, both suspended sediment and sediment transport or bed load transport. Uh, you know, multiple different sediment class sizes. It's a very good program. Um, and what's nice about it is that it's completely free and you can also run it on uh, basically as, as many instances as you want. So if you have access to a large computational cluster, you can put this, install this on, on the computational cluster and, and run it, um, you know, multiple different simulations at the same time. And uh, you can also run it in parallel too. So it's it's a very, very flexible and very useful program to do hydrodynamic modeling uh, in a research context, uh, as well as in, in, uh, in the, you know, if you're a civil engineer and you're doing this, for your day job or something, it's it's great for that too. It has a little bit of a learning curve, but you know this video. I hope this video series. I hope really helped everybody kind of understand it a little bit more. Uh, and so, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any suggestions for future videos, if there's something that's really bothering you, uh, maybe I can find the time to produce a video and put it up on my channel. Anyways, have a good day. Bye.